Hi there, I'm Andrea Koppel, and it's time for Coffee, the podcast where you get to hear firsthand what the jobs and careers that interest you the most are really like. Hey there, Java junkies. Welcome back to another episode of T for C. If you're interested in national security and you like the idea of solving big problems, then this is the episode for you. Because my next guest is a retired U.S. Army colonel who spent 32 years in uniform before co-founding Hacking for Defense, an academic program taught at 22 plus universities all over the U.S. that has adapted problem solving techniques used on the battlefields of Iraq and Afghanistan and combine them with best practices used by successful Silicon Valley startups. But before I introduce you to Pete Newell, I want to make sure you've signed up for the Java Junkies Journal. That's time for Coffee's weekly newsletter that comes out on Mondays to give you an exclusive peek inside the episodes and the professionals we're going to be featuring that week. Just head over to the Time for Coffee website at time the number four coffee.org and sign up. Now, my Nespresso loving national security wonks, please grab your mug and take a chug of your favorite caffeinated beverage because it's time for another caffeinated career conversation. And my next guest is retired U.S. Army Colonel Pete Newell, a nationally recognized innovation expert whose work is transforming how the government and other large organizations compete and drive growth. Pete is the CEO of BMNT, an innovation consultancy and early stage technology incubator that works with national security organizations to help them solve pernicious problems. And he's also a founder and co-author with lean startup founder Steve Blank, of Hacking for Defense, H4, the number 4D, an academic program that's taught at more than 22 universities. H4D uses the H4X framework to solve complex problems critical to government around national security, energy networks, cybersecurity, and AI, while providing students with a platform to gain crucial problem-solving experience while performing a national service. Prior to joining BMNT, Pete served as the director of the U.S. Army's Rapid Equipping Force, REF, reporting directly to the senior leadership of the Army. He was charged with rapidly finding, integrating, and employing solutions to emerging problems faced by soldiers on the battlefield. Pete is also an Army Ranger who has received numerous awards, including the Silver Star and the Presidential Unit Citation. By the way, if you want to learn more about what Pete does in his current job as the CEO of BMNT and how he built his remarkable career in the private sector, check out the show notes for this episode to see if the main T4C interview with Pete has already been released. Pete, welcome to Time for Coffee. Are you caffeinated and ready to go? I am, and I promise to stay that way for the rest of the day. Excellent. What is your beverage of choice? Uh, straight black coffee. <laughs> of course it is, right? Mo- what military guy like or gal puts milk in their coffee, right? You don't have refrigeration when you're out there on the battlefield. No, and I, and I tell you, I never drank coffee until I went to ranger school. And and quite frankly, you're so starved that you'll eat or drink anything you get your hands on. And there was always coffee. So I found over you know, a 30-year career, the only time I touched coffee is when I was desperately cold or it was the middle of the night and I was trying to stay awake. For some reason, when I retired and, and became a startup founder, I was always both, <laughs> not but always trying to stay awake. Oh, my goodness. Well, I would like to say try to get more sleep. Not much. Yeah. Well, let me start by thanking you, Pete, sincerely for your 32 years of service to this country. Well, thank you. I'm happy to pass that on to a younger generation. I'm a proud father of an Army captain today who's, you know, a third generation Army officer. I'm happy to to pass the buck to somebody younger with better legs than I have. 
listen, we couldn't keep this country safe without those of you men and women who are willing to do the hard work. So thank you so much, sir. I want to now pivot into our 10 espresso shots. And we're going to frame it under the banner of national security writ large when I ask you the first espresso shot, which is what entry level jobs are available to those young people who want to break into this field? So I'm going to break it up into two categories. I mean, the, the first obvious one is join the military, whether that's join as a reservist or a part of the uh, National Guard or as you know an active duty member, either enlisted or an officer. That first and foremost, I, I can't tell you how much that has done for me personally. And, and coming from a family like that, I can tell you that that version of national service is unlike anything that you will ever run across in your lifetime. The other option is clearly the government and intelligence agencies and other folks are constantly looking for bright young people that have a different view of the world that are critical to how they see things. So there are hundreds, if not thousands, of entry-level analyst jobs from virtually every field you can possibly describe available to folks now. So that's in like CIA, DIA, sure. State Department, Department of Energy, obviously State, the Pentagon. Yep. Yeah. All of them. And it's surprising. I have close friends and lots of people in the CIA work with that, you know, frankly, some of the things that are hard for them are finding biologists or folks with humanities backgrounds. Not just, hey, I need somebody who understands AI or I need an engineer. We really, across the board within the intelligence agency and the government, need every type and possibility of background and capability they can come up with. Oh, that is really interesting. I had no idea. So, Pete, what is a useful skill or skills that you've looked for over the years in the young people that you've hired? I can name several, and they're prevalent here at BMNT. The first I look for, you know, quite frankly, is the person I'm talking to engaging. And I've raised a couple of sons, and he had this conversation about, can you look somebody in the eyes and carry on a conversation? You'd be surprised at how many folks have not been socialized that way and difficult to carry on a conversation with. I am deeply attracted to people who are what I would call aggressively curious. And by aggressively curious, it means that they're willing to, when they see something they don't understand, they just don't shrug their shoulders, but they actually start digging away at it until it reaches a point where, okay, I, I, I think I understand this. The next one would be a lack of fear. And it's not in a physical sense. Our best analysts are folks who can sit at the table with folks 20 years old of them, look them in the eye and have a professional discussion, sometimes argument, about something in particular. But they know their facts, and if they're the smartest person in the room, they're not afraid to present what they think, nor are they afraid to seek out feedback that may help guide them in one particular direction or another. Getting and taking feedback is probably the biggest thing. The last thing in the world that, that we want to hire is somebody who is unwilling to ask for and receive very honest feedback, either about their performance or about something they're trying to do. Let me ask you if this resonates with you, because in my experience, the way I might describe the last thing that you touched on there, the lack of fear, it's not so much from my, again, from my standpoint, that they don't feel intimidated or afraid, but that they can overcome that in order to speak truth to power or push back or whatever the case may be. Does that resonate with you? That's absolutely true. And that's the very important point that make to people. It, it's not that you're afraid of something. True strength is your ability to overcome your own fears either personal or, or physical strength, it really is. Can you face your fears and continue to function? Yeah, because I got to tell you, there have been so many times in my professional life, and I am now I'm on my fourth career, when I was really afraid and intimidated, and that didn't necessarily go away in the early stages, and eventually you acclimate to it. But it's Absolutely. just that ability to push forward. Absolutely. You know, I'm a 
I would tell you I'm a classic introvert. I'm not not a fan of large crowds and big meetings and lots of people. But over the years, I have taught myself that there is a, a specific need and role in the room for people like me. So I have learned to talk to large crowds and to deal with big meetings and things like that. But understanding there's a trade-off. You know, for every minute I spend in a meeting like that, I, I need some time away. But I, I think that plays out regardless of whether you're an introvert or an extrovert or whether you're afraid of certain things or not. Absolutely. And that is a great example. So, Pete, is someone's major a deciding factor to get into the field of national security writ large? In other words, if they haven't studied, let's say, national security or international affairs, I mean, you threw out a science there a couple of minutes ago. Is it a deal breaker? No, I, I don't think so. I, I have peers who would say, well, you're not a professional at this, so I'm not interested in talking to you. I think that having spent several years in and among startups, I found, particularly running the hacking for defense program, some of the best and brightest people we have run across and some of the, the best pivots that have been done have really been driven by people who weren't they weren't experienced and, and they weren't experts at something. But you know, again, there are people who lacked fear. The big difference is they didn't bring any of their preconceived notions or baggage or anything else to the table. So they were, quite frankly, they were blank slates. A blank slate is something that provides a great deal of opportunity for the right boss. If you have somebody who's willing to work hard and to study and to think and to seek out feedback and is a self-motivator, I don't care what your background is. I'd rather have that than somebody who is a a quasi-expert who stopped learning, you know, years ago. Excellent. What about a graduate school degree? And that's less so for the entry-level folks, more so for someone who really wants to make it to the top of the chain of command. And in that case, what are the most useful ones to have? I know you have an MS from the U.S. Army Command and General Staff College. You also have an MS from National Defense University and a couple of really impressive advanced certificates. What do you recommend, Pete? You know, the first thing, and I'll say this, I'm not a critic of everybody. I'm not a fan of folks who go straight from their bachelor's degree straight into a master's program. I think the experience that you gain in the real world between that bachelor's degree program and a master's degree program really enables you to bring something to the plate while you're getting that master's degree. In terms of master's, I think it's less about the degree than the experience you gain while you're in the courses. My young son who's a captain in the Army now is about that point where he's thinking about master's programs. And we've had lots of conversations about what's most viable. Is an MBA better than an MA or an MS in international policy or something like that? And my answer to him is it, it's a wash. It, it's not the degree. It's the experience you get that your university is going to provide you in the process of getting that degree. You really have to dig into the guts of the program and ask, A, who's teaching your courses? Is you know, Are they graduate assistants or are they really professors? Are they adjuncts or somebody else? Are they bringing other people in to the university who have real-world experience and things that are happening today, or are they rather insular and really just an academic approach? Um, and then you have to look at the quality of the research that they're doing regardless of what they're doing. Is Are you going to be pushed to the boundaries of what you can do so that you truly have mastered you know, whatever it is you're trying to do. I'm not a fan of saying one degree over the other. I look for the experience that somebody achieved while they were doing it. Oh, that is wonderful insight. Thank you. What about life experiences? What, in your opinion, are the most useful ones to have for someone who's starting out in the field of national security? I think that this is a case where experience trumps all. I've worked with folks who have no degrees, who are the world's experts in international affairs. I, I tell the story some days of you know, being in Afghanistan, working with Afghani military folks who couldn't read or write, but were fantastic storytellers and artists. And to watch people like that tell a story and draw a picture of something that clearly drew out 
really intricate points of international affairs was absolutely fascinating. So I'm really careful about picking one thing over the next. Again, I I think it is a personal thing, your ability to articulate something in a public forum. Can you craft an argument? Can you present yourself? Can you listen? And can you learn from the other people around you? Wonderful. So, Pete, what has been the best part for you of being in this profession the first 32 years of your life in uniform and now in the private sector? I tell it without being overly dramatic. First and foremost, military officer, I've been surrounded by the best and brightest young men and women this country has to offer, working in the crappiest environments that you could ever place them in. The brotherhood, sisterhood, tribalism, whatever that comes from that, that goes beyond race, creed, color, nationality, or anything else. The true bonding of groups of people like that is something that most folks will never experience in a lifetime. And and first and foremost, I will tell you that 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 may be the most rewarding part of it. The second is being given things that are super hard, super complex, a team of people without the right tools, right training, and still overcoming virtually every obstacle that's thrown in front of you to actually achieve whatever your purpose was. And then beyond that is, is simply the the degree of pride young folks like that have in themselves and the confidence that they leave with inspiring. So the flip side, not about your first career, but about your current career as the president and CEO of BMNT, what is the part that sucks the most? Wow. Yeah, first of all, I think we partially answered the question because I'm both the CEO and the president. I think what sucks the most changes over time. You know, early on as a startup with four guys, a girl on a driveway, is simply trying to stay alive and make an income and, and pay people and doing things. I, I will tell you that for the first few years, the the stress induced by making payroll every month. And we did every month, although sometimes in order to make a payroll, I either didn't pay myself or I took money out of my own bank account to ensure that the people that we were working with, to include contractors, got paid on time. I went without an income for a year so that we could afford to hire more people to do more work so that we could grow the company. What sucks in that process is you're essentially telling your family and, and everybody else that you're betting the entire bank and their comfort and their life on your ideas and your ability to gather the right people and do things. The constant stress that comes from living in that environment is tough to live with, and it sucks. <laughs> yeah. Today, having been through that, now running a, a company that, that's got an international presence and well over 50 employees and plenty of income and is doubling in size every year, I think what sucks is when I get drug away from the things that are important to us and my ability to touch our clients and and young people and do things, and I'm surrounded by things like making decisions about different tax strategies and different banks and different finance models. And, you know, it's it's all the backroom stuff that, quite frankly, isn't sexy and isn't a lot of fun. But it's all hugely necessary because if you screw those decisions up, you have 50 people who have you know, hung their hats on your ability to carry the water. Absolutely. It isn't fun, but it's got to get done. <laughs> so, Pete, what is the best career advice you've ever gotten? I've gotten so much, quite frankly, because I needed so much. In other words, I've screwed those so many things up. I've had lots of people counseling me. You know, I, I think one of the first things, and I think it probably set me on the path I'm currently on, is when, when I took over the Army's Rapid Equipment Force, I had just left Iraq after spending a year as a senior commander there, you know, running an organization of 5,000 some odd people. But I was involved in the tactical level fight, which means I was an infantryman, not in the science or the acquisition and engineering of, of widgets and things like that that actually go to the battlefield. I was a user. And when I took over the rapid equipment force, uh, a retired general sat me down and said, Pete, there's nothing anybody has left to teach you about being a tactical officer in combat. You've got it. You've got more experience than most people ever ought to get. He went on to say, but you understand nothing of business. You don't know anything. 
and you need to get out of this place and go meet and talk to people who run the businesses who provide the technology and the people and the other things that the Department of Defense relies on so much. And I found myself following in advice, you know, every from the point of I had to learn about money, which means I had to go all the way to Capitol Hill and find out how the budget was built on an annual basis because we got our money straight from Congress. I had to find the people in, in the back corners of the Pentagon who actually moved the dollars digitally to our contracts that did things. So I had to learn about contracts. And I spent the better part of 18 months going back to school to learn a, a very different business than, than I was in. The second bit of advice I actually got from a guy named Peter Hurst, who is the director of MIT's executive education programs. And it was interesting because I'd gone to MIT to essentially look at some technology, and the gentleman who was escorting me around, his name was Charles Sue. Charles, I swear, was about five foot tall, 40 years old, had sold two or three companies for, I don't know, half billion dollars a piece, got bored, went to Harvard, got a law degree, and essentially was working at MIT for free, just helping people. Charles, essentially, you know, in just walking around campus with these guys over the course of a year, taught me a lot about intellectual curiosity and, and a lack of fear, but the desire to go go out and understand things. And then Peter Hurst stepped in. When I looked at him and said, I, I don't have years, but I, I really need to understand the rest of the world. How do I do that? <laughs> and Peter did a great job of explaining to me, you know, that process of, I call it adult education, but how to middle-aged men and women go back to school and learn about things that they'll use long in the future. I've subscribed to that mentality ever since. I, I call myself a professional student. I am most jazzed when I'm in an environment where I can learn something new. And I don't care who it is who teaches to me. Absolutely. And even though we haven't yet really gotten into your career, it sounds like you kept getting thrown into the deep end. And then you did it to yourself. (laughs) Right? Absolutely. Well, thank you so much for sharing that. So two final espresso shots. What movies, if any, or Netflix, Hulu, Amazon shows, or fiction books do you think accurately depict this profession? Very few. Black Hawk Down is about is is accurate again some of the most recent ones that reflect some of the real life stories coming out of afghanistan are are pretty accurate now talk about black hawk down because i actually joined the third ranger battalion right after they came back from mogadishu in fact the guy matt eversman who's the squad leader depicted in the the movie by i think by matt damon was actually my desk mate for a long time Mm. i think that when you realize particularly in most of special operations organizations, just how quietly professional those people really are. It's inspiring. For books, you know, if you're aware of the, the recent Medal of Honor awardee, David Bellavia, but Bellavia's book, House to House, is probably the best depiction of the nitty-gritty, what it's like to be a young infantryman in the middle of a really crappy fight. So it's a great book. There's a book called New Dawn that was written about the same battle, but from a macro sense that, that I think is also value added that are worthwhile. David Bellavia gave a great speech at his Medal of Honor ceremony, and it is well worth if I don't care where you come from, it is well worth just listening to him. Wonderful. I'll include all of that in our show notes. So final espresso shot, Pete. What would our young Java junkies be surprised to learn about your profession. It is full of the hardest, sexiest problems that you can ever put your hands on. Magnitude, anything you think you can find in the civilian world, and I guarantee it not only exists in national security, but it's probably 10 times as bad. So if you really want to be challenged, it's a great place to go and get you know, an experience that you can't get in the civilian world without sitting in a job for 10 years. Well, fantastic. Thank you so much, Pete, for making time for coffee. I want to let our young listeners know that Pete, on top of everything else he does, 
is also the co-host of the Innovators Podcast, which is broadcast by KZSU, that's Stanford University's FM radio station, and it's great conversations with mission-driven entrepreneurs and investors, and I'm sure you're going to enjoy it. You can also check out Hacking the Number 4 Defense on the internet and see whether a university that you're at, college that you're at, is teaching that course because you may want to check it out. Pete, thank you so much for making Time for Coffee today with me and the Time for Coffee community. I really enjoyed it. Well, thanks so much for the invitation. Thanks so much for listening to Time for Coffee, where the professionals in the jobs that most interest you always have time to grab coffee 24-7, no matter where you live. I have one quick favor to ask you. Remember to rate, review, and subscribe to Time for Coffee. Thanks so much.